All right. A very good afternoon to everyone that comes on to our Family First Malaysia webinar for this Sunday afternoon. I believe you had a very good service, every one of you, worshipping the Lord. And we thank you for your participation. Your presence here is really appreciated because you are an encouragement to all of us and also to our speaker for this afternoon. Now, some housekeeping rules for everyone. Uh, beside me is my wife. Uh, Florence, and she will co-host, uh, co-moderate with us, with me, and we pray that we will be able to learn something from our speaker this afternoon. Yeah. Now, some housekeeping rules. Um, mute your microphone um, during the talk so that we will not create any sound or disturbances to our speaker. However, after the question, during the question and answer time, you need to ask questions or you need to say something, then you can unmute yourself or after that, when we have, our host has unmuted you, right? Now, the other thing is camera. I know we like to see our own face there, but please, if you want, mm -hmm. uh, you're not well-dressed, you're not in a proper environment, switch off the camera so that you will not, we will not see things that we do not like to see, 
okay? Now, if you want to eat or anything, uh, switch off the camera, then take your bite because we would want to see you chewing and then our speaker is talking and everyone is watching you eat and then we get hungry ourselves. So the Bible said, thou shall not tempt your brothers and sisters. <laughs> All right? Now, uh, the other thing is that if you have any question during the course of the talk, and anything you like, I will speak it to, to explain further or highlight to you further. Please put them in the chat column, right? If you go down to the bottom of your screen, put your mouse there, you will see the chat. Type, type, click it there and type it. Make sure you type it well. And then after the talk, during the question and answer time, we'll pick it up and we will be able to post it to our speaker for this afternoon. Right, and then during the question and answer time, if you're not posted to any question, and if you have any question during that time, give us a shout out, okay? Give us a hand, raise hand, or say something so that we can get onto you and let you ask the question to our speaker. Okay, so that we have, after we have taken care of the housekeeping, I'll pass this time to our chairman, Brother Tan Tik Singh, to take over. Yeah, thank Brother you, uh, Richard, you know, for, uh, uh, you know the uh, you know sharing these uh, house rules, and uh, first and foremost, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, coming to our webinar to be blessed by Dato Kenny, uh, who is a wonderful brother of mine and also a great speaker. Right, yeah. he has been actually speaking in conferences, in many other uh, seminars and churches as well. So, Family First Malaysia, we actually host this webinar uh, once every two weeks this year and uh, this year our theme is that create a blessing to the family that means uh, a culture of blessing so that means when we talk about the creating the culture of blessing we are inviting speakers to speak always in relating to the family matters so today uh, of course we will i will introduce the speaker in a short while but in the meantime, for those who do not know what Family First is all about, so I just want to just share with you Family First in Malaysia. It is actually a not-for-profit organization. Right, Media, can you just put on the screen? So now you see that Family First Malaysia is a not-for-profit organization. We serve people regardless of ethnic, religious background, or social status. And we practice these seven values that govern our words and actions. Now we believe every human being is of infinite worth. And the best place to discover this is within the family. And we believe that strong, healthy families are the cornerstone of civilization. We also believe that family, every family can be happier, stronger, and more united. We believe in the power of prayer and the eternal value of every soul. We believe in the power of partnership, that together we can do much, much more than we could ever do on our own. And we believe that we must always conduct all our operations, partnership and finances with the highest ethical and moral standards. We believe we must always respect and fully comply with all local and national laws in every jurisdiction in which we, we operate. And Family First Malaysia vision yeah, is to transform the next gen generation fathers supported by mothers to build better families resulting in a better workplace, a better society and a stronger nation. And our mission is to partner with like-minded organizations to restore, reshape, and release men and women to become better couples and parents in the context of original marriage in, uh, with our 3F focus, there is family, finance, and also fitness. Now, Family First Malaysia, we uh, concentrate on this area, on the better family, better finance, and also a better fitness. Of course, in the better family, we have got six modules that we take all our uh, mentee couples through to uh, go through these uh, six modules. It takes about, you know, each module will take about one to one and a half hours. And also it is all through Zoom, right? And uh, on the better finance, there are four modules 
we will also help couples go through all their modules so that the, uh, they will be able to, uh, to manage their finances better as couples and also so that they will become uh, actually debt free, right? And of course, next, we talk about the better fitness. You see, we have, you have good family, you have, the, you have the wealth, but if you don't have the fitness, that means you will not be able to also serve well. Now, on the family sector, we want to double our love, joy, and peace in our families to restore broken relationships, reshape the home environment, and release next generation leaders using home as a starting point of leadership training. Now, from the finance sector, we want to double our income or net profit ethically and righteously. We value innovation to double our giving with all bad debt settled and achieving oneness with money as a family, beginning with fathers and mothers to model better financial stewardship. And on the fitness side, we want to double our mental and also physical health through cultivation of positive mental attitude, holistic exercise and nutrition, resulting in high energy and wisdom to achieve things of big and lasting impact. Now, you can follow us uh, for the updates on our Family First Malaysia website. So take your camera and also take a snapshot of this, uh, you know, our QR code so that you can go into our website. You can follow us on the Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, yeah, and also LinkedIn. And uh, since our, you know, we are non-profit organizations, so therefore all our directors are serving pro bono basis. And even our, uh, we don't, do not have full-time staff, we have a part-time staff who is taking a very, very minimal uh, allowance to, uh, to, you know, that is where, uh, as I say, that we are actually very lean. So every dollar that is being donated to our, this uh, uh, ministry will be properly used to expand the kingdom work. Just like today, you can see that this webinar, we do it, last year we did it every week, you know, we have done this webinar every week, but this year we do it twice. You know, that means uh, once every two, two weeks so that to be able to bring all this blessing and the topics which are relevant to all the people that are actually uh, journeying with us. So, and uh, we want to, you know, certainly see that many of you are really been blessed by us. And uh, thank you so much for this. And today, you know, we have this, uh, you know, we are talking about leaving a legacy. Now, leaving a legacy means putting a stamp on the future and uh, making a contribution to future generations. People want to leave a legacy because they want to feel that their life matters. And of course, today we have Dato Kenny Ng. Uh, he holds uh, actually a bachelor of a degree uh, from the Real University and also a master of law degree. So from this, uh, uh, as I say that, you know, from, from this, uh, sorry, uh, he holds a master degree, uh, also uh, a law and also a barrister at the Lincoln Inn, all right? And uh, he is also uh, conferred uh, this the honorary doctor of divinity from the Millennium International School in collaboration with Asia Pacific Seminary. Now, professionally, he is a, a professional uh, lawyer, advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaysia, and also a certified mediator of the Malaysian Mediation Center, and a member of the Association of Course and also Executive Accountants in UK. And most important thing that you can see that, you know, our Dato Kenny, not only that he's professionally qualified, his heart is for the poor and marginalized. And he is an advocate of the poor and marginalized. Now, currently, uh, Dato Kenny is the managing partner of the law firm called Azri Lee Sui Seng and Company, where he specializes in commercial and corporate law and also mediation of shareholders and family disputes. He is also active all right, in serving the community 
as an advisor in 20 plus you know ngos as a chairman of the uh, this uh, of the various organizations right and uh, he's also championing this pastor raymond co uh, also you know pastor raymond co who disappeared you know three years ago and then you know now coming to four years and so he's championing that and also uh, helping to actually raise funds to support you know the legal matters and uh, of course he's also the legal advisor to ta university college and uh, this uh, alumni association and uh, he actually received actually an award from the uh, this uh, ta university uh, as uh, i think 2019 now as part of the social responsibility you know he advocates and fights for justice on a pro bono basis you know for the poor and marginalized such as aboriginal people religious freedom such as lina joy case or the three Allah cases and the four enforced disappearance of pastor raymond ko amri chemak and the couple of uh, these uh, other people right now, besides that, he's also active in the corporate world, where he served as an independent director in five public listed companies, right? Now, I think that the, he's also the chairman of Patana, Patama Digital Berhad, which is a China-owned company with this business entirely in China. Now, he's also, you know, recognized uh, by the king in 2011 and conferred a sort of a, uh, he was actually conferred a, a datoship by the king of Malaysia, right? Now, Dato Kenny is uh, blissfully married for 41 years uh, to his wife, Diana, uh, who, is also, who is a chartered accountant. They have three children, yeah? And uh, they are happily married. And now that, you know, Dato Kenny can actually serve not only just, you know, in this uh, legal, legal firm, but he also served in the community. Now today, Dato Kenny will share from his heart, his experience to help you start building this legacy and also guide you to start living in a way you want to be remembered so that you can start building your legacy by making best use of your time, energy, resources, so that you can live a purposeful life. So I give you Dato Kenny right now. So Dato Kenny, the show is yours. Dato Kenny, are you there? Thank you, Brother Tek Singh, for that very kind introduction. I am truly honored by humble by this invitation to share with you. This is second time with uh, uh, Family First Malaysia. This afternoon, I'll share with you on the subject matter of leaving a legacy in the marketplace. Uh, those who are working in the marketplace, we play a very important role now. We have the conviction that God has carved out that mission field for us in that marketplace. And as that representative of our family, we want to make sure by the grace of God, our life count for the kingdom of God. And how one day when we retire, when, it, when God in his goodness, in his timing, and called us home, we would have left something behind for the next generation or the generations to come. I'm a professional lawyer. One of the areas that I handle quite a fair bit is to advise and help a lot of families, especially Chinese families in uh, family, wealth and succession planning. An average businessman, Chinese businessman, many of them started in a very humble uh, beginning. They, they, they came and see me once upon a time, what kind of uh, uh, business to be incorporated, how to go about it, I advise. Over the years, they may get a loan from the bank, I advise them, and there'll be some mergers, acquisition, joint ventures with other people. Uh, they come and see me, I advise them as well. And in between, sometimes they have shareholders dispute, especially family shareholders dispute. 
I'll come in also as a qualified professional mediator. And uh, from my experience as an elder in the church, I help to counsel and bring peace to that kind of dispute in a, fam in a family business. And I like all China men, when a business has grown to a certain size, they want to consider what will happen when they are no more around. Usually three things I'll advise them. One, how to preserve their wealth and assets in the interim while the business is around, while the businessman is still around, especially how to protect these assets from their potential creditors. And also secondly, in the meanwhile, how to make sure that these assets, when you put, place them on trust, how to make sure that these assets also grow in value over a period of time. And then lastly, when they are no more around, what happened to their wealth? What happened to their assets? What will be the succession order? Who takes over and who does what? And I advise that quite a fair bit. It is an integrated area of business over the years. I'm involved in all these things. I'm putting them all together to provide a one-stop wholesome integrated service. Many people, whether we like it or not, we leave a legacy behind in our life. Hardly have anyone who leaves this world with a neutral legacy. Either we leave a legacy that is positive by our life, by our values, by our culture, by what we do, or we leave behind a negative legacy. So it's something that we all ought to think through seriously. And this is one area that I've been uh, uh, thinking through, try to redefine and try to refine it over the years. And this afternoon, I'll share with you some thoughts in my experience intending to leave a legacy when I retire from my law firm, when I retire from the marketplace. What is the basis of thinking seriously leaving behind a good legacy? I think the starting point for all of us must be the hill at Calvary. Once upon a time, I wasn't a Christian. In December 1976, by the grace of God, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord. That Calvary experience has transformed my life. I've experienced what it means to be loved by God unconditionally. And out of that, out of the experience, what it means to love others unconditionally. And in order to uh, fashion and value our conviction in the way that we live, in a way that we do business, in a way that we deal with other people in the marketplace. We must, by the grace of God and through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, help us to work it out that our life may be a blessing that in due course of time, when we're no more around, we leave behind something that our Lord Jesus Christ would be proud of. And when that day, when we see our Lord Jesus Christ again, he will say, welcome home, good and faithful servant. And this afternoon, I'll share with you in practical terms what I do in my law firm in leaving behind a legacy. The starting point, because of we think out of business, generally an average uh, uh, China man as far as business is concerned, they model it under what we call an ownership model. I'm the boss. I own this business. All the assets, the employees, everybody, I pay their salary, I own them. They are all at my back and call. And the uh, ultimate, the, uh, the uh, 
The raison d'etre for an average businessman in the marketplace is to make profit by all means, if possible, if they are unscrupulous. There's nothing wrong with making profit so long it is legally and morally uh, obtained. No issue with that. Without profit, a lot of things, the business cannot be sustained. And as a Christian, our experience is not an ownership model at all. Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, by the blood he shed at Calvary, purchased me at a price. I don't belong to myself anymore. Whatever I own, whatever I know, whatever I have, don't belong to me anymore. Jesus Christ is my master. I am his servant. I take his beating. My calling is to be obedient to that master. And therefore, whatever little business, big business, whatever talents that I have, many or little, all these I do not own. These are temporary blessings by the goodness of God and in his mercy have blessed me for me in the interim. And we are all in this world in the interim. The world is not our home. Our time will come one day. And in the interim, we are here to be called to be good stewards of what God has blessed us. Our assets, our skills, our talents, our money, our time. So the starting point is that the experience of the Calvary but love mold us, transform us. We realize that we must be good stewards of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I look at it, my business, whatever that I have, I got to be that responsible, good steward to make sure things are well taken care of, that on that day when I see my Lord Jesus Christ face to face, I can look straight into his, into his face, eye to eye, and he welcomes me back as a good and faithful servant. And with that kind of conviction, that will fashion the culture that we adopt and the values that we implement in doing business, in dealing with people, in dealing with money. For me, there are three very important P's for a business. Uh, if you go to Harvard MBA, they tell you that uh, the raison d'etre in any business is profit. As I say earlier on, nothing wrong with profit. But to me, as a Christian, profit is not my primary responsibility. Profit, technically, is not my problem. Profit is God's problem. There are two very important P before the profit P, which as the followers of Jesus Christ in the market, I believe we put it in that priority, God in this goodness or bless us with profit as a consequence of our faithfulness and obedience in our calling in the marketplace as a disciple of Jesus Christ. The first P in business as a priority is people, people first, not profit first. Profits is a last, as a consequence of putting people first. The second P in that priority is a planet, the planet that we live in. The system, the values, the laws, the administration, how we do business, the planet. And then lastly, as I say, in that order, by the grace of God, if you take care of the first, first P, people well, if you take care of the planet well, I believe our good God, based on my personal experience, God will bless us with that profit. And over these years, despite it up and down, I've done business for so many years without needing to ask for any loans from the bank. 
and every month by the goodness of the Lord, I'm able to meet all my overheads on time and more often than not ahead of time as a deliberate policy in my doing business. Why people? People is important. God is love. And God manifested love in three, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whomsoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Love is not something romantic, not something wishy-washy, not something that comes out of Hollywood or Bollywood. Love in biblical perspective is a verb, an action word. For God so loved the world, he gave. And therefore, our starting point in putting people first, he said, God is love. God loves us and in turn, our calling in the marketplace is to love people first. And over the years, I have practicalized that uh, various ways that I can put into practice to uh, practice these values and form part and parcel of the culture in my firm. Generally, for me, as a relatively small firm, there'll be three categories of people that I could deal with them every day. Now, all of them are equally important. First of all, my staff, my, 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 my lawyers and associates, my partners in the firm. The second the category, I got to deal with them. They pay all my bills, my clients. And the third category of people that I deal with, uh, deal every day, are the people that do business with us. My part-time Indonesian cleaner that comes uh, three times a week to clean our office. My part-time uh, computer man fix all the technical problems with our computers in the office. My stationary supplier, who suppliers from day one, 30 over years ago, still doing that. And people like that. So the underlying principle that I apply is this. Then. I ought to deal with them in the way Jesus Christ would have dealt with them. And how would Jesus Christ treat them? Jesus will look at them from that perspective of love and compassion for them. And over the years, I realized that the winning principle in dealing with these people is this, this universal, timeless, golden rule. Do unto others what we want others do unto us. It's a positive rule, doing something for the other as what you want others to do for us. It is not a negative to don't do, don't do to unto others what we don't want others to do unto us. That will be simple. You can fold your arms and do nothing. But here our calling is this, the golden rule. Do unto others what we want others do unto us. Once upon a time when I first came to Kuala Lumpur, as a young man, 40 over years ago, not knowing anybody in a big strange city, I start lowly. The time before I became a lawyer, start lowly in my employment. And as an employee, we know that if our colleagues, our bosses treat us with respect, with decency, treat us as we are fellow human beings, we feel confident, we feel good. It's a fundamental principle that we must not forget. And therefore, as best as I know how, by the grace of God, the way that I deal with my staff, the way that I deal with my clients, 
the way that I deal with my associates is to at all time conscious of this timeless golden rule, doing unto them what they would, what we would want them to do unto us. For a staff, they are fellow human beings. Average, my, my staff, they work for me a long time, basically from working class background, come to the office, earn a decent living, keep their family together, pay their bills. We must conscious of the struggle and the challenges that they, that they have. And my job as an employee, as a, as a boss, is to encourage, is to affirm, is to, is to be with them. And not to make life additionally more difficult. Treat them decently. There must be any request. There must always be pleased and there must always be thank you. To make sure that this is part and parcel of our culture. Nobody uh, use bad words against each other. Nobody call, call each other names and that kind of culture is not on with me. And not only that, a sense of integrity in doing things professionally, follow the rule book, even though it is at our detriment. I don't impose upon the clients to tell the lie. I tell the receptionist when my client call, if I'm busy, tell him I'm busy, I'll call back. Don't tell the lie that the boss is not in. Don't tell the lie that the boss will call you back and never call back. Fundamental values like that. I don't pay the highest salary in town, but given the resources and the size of my firm, I believe by the grace and mercy and goodness of the Lord, we pay fair salary. We have that fair salary policy in our firm to make sure that they are paid. And come what may, we pay all our staff on the 28th day of every month. If the 28th day is a public holiday, we pay them the day before. And for those who are celebrating any main holiday, Christmas, Chinese New Year, Deepavali, Hari Raya, these are the staff who celebrate. You have pay them their salary way in advance so that they have the money to organize for their family to enjoy their festival. Over the years, I have, uh, uh, thankfully, my turnover rate, staff turnover rate is relatively low. About, about three years ago, my office boy, Din. Din was with the firm since day one in 1987 when Dato Li Sui Singh started the firm. He uh, called it a day about three years ago. Because he started his employment early, just by natural increment, we don't even have a ceiling salary for people like that. Small firm, rather informal. By then he left us about three years ago. His basic take home pay is already 2005 as an office boy, dispatch boy. And then uh, in his claims, of course claims we charge a client when they deliver letters, deliver certain thing, they make a claim from the disbursement account in each file. And from the claims and miscellaneous, everything, traveling and everything else, he, take, he took home at that time, average about 4,002, 4,003 a month as my office boy. I'm so proud of him. And some years ago, when Dean's uh, elder son got married, I was invited to that family uh, lunch banquet. I, I sat at the second table next to their family table. He lives in a double story Ling house, corner house away from town. And I, I, I see all the family, the elder son got married. The elder son is a medical doctor. And he has two other children, two other sons, all three of them are professional. On that day, I was sitting there looking at the family. 
it softened my heart. While looking at the family deliberating, my eyes was a little moist. I was so overjoyed for this family. And God touched me to say that, son, you have invested this family rightly. Even though he is an office boy, the little investment you put into this man and his family, he has raised up three professionals. Similarly, my former driver, Pachit Hassan, retired at the age of 68 as my driver. One daughter, two sons. The eldest daughter is also a medical, she's a specialist. And the, uh, the husband also a medical specialist. The other two sons are professionals as well. One engineer and one IT man. Johanna, my maid, gone back in uh, October 2019, faithfully served, served in our household for 20 years. She's a fellow Christian. Before that, we have another maid surface for 12 years from, uh, from uh, Philippines, Helia. This one, Johanna from Indonesia. When she came, she shared that she was so, so fearful. She lived away, far, far away, far flung island, applied to be a mate in Malaysia, no certainty she'll be able to get a job. But in order to stand a better place, she has to go early uh, to the headquarters of the uh, labor agent, agency in Jakarta, squat there and wait, hopefully, she will be chosen by a prospective employer in Malaysia. She left behind her home, parents, husband, and two young, very young children who were hardly early primary school. And for one month, there was no news whether she will be taken up to come over in Malaysia. She cried. And when news came that uh, she was chosen to be with our home, she prayed so hard that God, that God will send her to the good Christian home. And meanwhile, when we got her, we are praying that God will send us a good housemaid for our household. Uh, Johanna came. She's a member. She was a member of my church for 20 years while she was here. She plays an active part in my uh, church in the ministry. And uh, after 10 years or so, when my children were bigger, nothing much to do at home. We still retain her, though technically nothing much to do, but that's beside the point. And in order to enhance her income, because uh, uh, her home is needy, we allow, in fact, we arrange for her to work part-time with other families within my condominium. Arrange for three other families whereby she can earn extra. And some of this potential uh, uh, employer part-time we will interview them and we arrange for three, four different places she can work. Uh, morning after we have gone out, 10.30, 11 o'clock, she will go to work and then come back by 3.30 or so. And we come home, there'll be dinner ready, home, everything is clean and proper. And at the end of the month, every month, she'll be able to have a take home pay or in at least 2,500 ringgit clean, food, lodging, clothing, odds and ends, everything we have the privilege to provide. She went back home 20, uh, after 20 years 
when the children have graduated from the university. She comes from a small village. And this is the first time in the history of that village that two children have been to university. And again, I would like to think over the 20 years, I'm convinced I am that Boash to, uh, to, uh, to Naomi, to Ruth, as her kinsman redeemer. And out of that money and saving, she was able to support two children, first time in the history of that village, two boys graduated from university, one in political science, the other in the natural sciences. Simple seeds that we sow, goodness of the Lord, mercy of the Lord, it grows, we leave a legacy behind. And I'm sure out of the experience, the two children in their own time will do likewise. Reminds me when I was small, I, we come from a very poor family. I dropped out of school at the age of 17, no money to study. But over the years, people have been kind to me, invested in me, trusted me, paying forward. So as a Christian, especially we experience the grace and the love of God, we're doing likewise to set a legacy, to pay it forward for the next generation. Similarly, for my clients, we deal with them honorably, greatest uh, standard of professional standard, and honor our promises, charge them reasonable fees. We are all consumers. And when clients come to us as my consumer, an average consumer, make sure three very important things. One, you do your job well, maintain high standards. In that sense, I'm very insistent on high standards in my firm. Two, deliver on our promises on time. Be professional with integrity. Don't ever cheat, don't ever take advantage. And then three, charge people fees that are reasonable. Fair and reasonable to my client, fair and reasonable to us as lawyers, given the time and the complexity uh, and the expertise and experience required for that job. Treat them that way. And over a period of time, I'm so thankful that most of my clients become my good friends. And not only good friends, we don't look at clients as a source to make money, to squeeze money out of them. Clients are people created in the image of God. They need the love of God they need the salvation of God. Do not be manipulative. Treat them applying that golden rule. And God in his goodness, because I've invested in relationship, somehow, somewhere, somewhat, there will be a referrer of new businesses every day without fail. People ask me, how do I do my PR in business? Do I have to dine and wine and then indulge with client late nights and anything at all? I say no necessity. Now, when my children were small, I make sure I go back home at 6.30 to spend time with the family. But I say my greatest PR is to invest genuine time, goodwill with my clients. 
But I say that uh, when there's someone ill that I know, my client or his family, I make sure I'll be there at the hospital. I'll send some fruit basket over. If somebody in their family pass away, I'll attend their funeral. I'll send the wreath over. And I didn't realize that these are very ordinary, actually very Christian thing to do. Now. Compassion, when they are in need, when they are in pain, in grief, be there. I didn't realize that over a period of time, this uh, paying attention to clients when they are in time of need and pain becomes such a strong selling point. Time and again, I get strangers calling me. He says that he's referred by so-and-so to, uh, to call me over this legal case. They need a lawyer. This, this, this person who, who introduced me told me that you were so kind. At that time, at my father's funeral, you were there all the way until the burial. He said that client was so touched. Similar stories that I've heard time and again. Do unto others what we want others to do unto us. Similarly, for my associates, those who supply us. My standing instruction to my office is this now. Do business on cash on delivery. In all my years of doing business, I have not owed any people a day later than is necessary. My standing instruction is honor, honor our debts. And there are some people we pay in advance. My, my computer man for many years, small timer, uh, cash flow issue. I pay him quarterly in advance. Many, many businessmen laugh at me, but my mom is so proud of me. Treat them well. In doing business, try to be, do business with small climber, those who are genuine, those who are honest, striving hard to earn a living, support them. Why? Once upon a time, I was poor and needy. God, in his goodness, sent people to support me. And likewise, the stationary uh, supplier had been with us from day one, 30 over years. We still do business with her. I'm not so sure hers is the cheapest. That That's beside the point. She gave me good service, honorable, reliable. And I support a single mother and that family. That's how I look at it. Not so much whether I can have two cents cheaper for, 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 for a piece of paper. So people are important. I'm convinced in the marketplace we are called to be Kingsman Redeemer to those under our charge, just like Boaz vis a -vis to Naomi, to Ruth. These are little things over the years we set the foundation, sow the seeds, and in the richness of time, in the fullness of time, before you know it, we'll leave a legacy in the lives of many people that cross our paths. Secondly, time is running. We look at the planet. Planet is basically the ecosystem, the administrative, the financial, the, uh, the political ecosystem that we operate in. There are two very important principles, two very important obligations as citizens in this country. In fact, as Christians, we are called to be citizens of two kingdoms. Uh, Jesus says, Render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Render unto God what belongs to God. We have obligations in both kingdoms. And in the, yeah, uh, those obligations, there is such thing as a legal obligation. 
whether you like it or not, there are legal obligation. And then secondly, in those two kingdoms, there are moral obligation. And in the kingdom of Caesar, our legal ob obligation is simple. As citizens of the state, no matter how good or no matter how bad the government is, we are called to be law abiding. Law abiding, do business according to the law, no, no cheating, no cutting corners, trust in the Lord, he will provide. Be law abiding, that is a legal requirement. Second requirement in the kingdom of Caesar, pay your taxes. It was due last week for individuals. Very simple. Whether we like it or not, Christians or non-Christians, when we do business, be law-abiding, be a good corporate citizen, law-abiding. When we make money, contribute to that common good, that common wealth or the welfare of all, we pay our taxes. But more importantly, as Christians, we are also called to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, we are not so much compelled by law, but we are very much compelled by Calvary love, that agape love, unconditional love of God. And in turn, we want to love other people. And in turn, we want to have our lives count for the kingdom of God in our society. And in my doing business, I also make sure that we apply the principle of, uh, of salt and light in my practice as, my, as a lawyer, in the practice of my business as a lawyer. Sort and light. Sort and light is very effective. Sometimes, time again, we hear lawyers, we hear citizens, we hear everybody, how corrupt the system is, how terrible. In fact, one of the greatest problems in our society is cynicism, hatred, negative vibes. As Christians, we don't do that. John Stock, as a commentator on the sword and light, he says it's very simple. These are two very ordinary household items during the time of Jesus Christ. He said in meat, in that kind of hot weather in the Middle East, where there's no refrigeration, by the end of the day, that meat will go bad. And nobody asks a question, why the meat goes bad? That is a silly question. The question that we ought to ask is, where is the salt to preserve that meat? Similarly, in that part of the world, before we have electricity, you know, come 6 p.m., 7 p.m., depending on the time of the year, a house will get dark. And nobody asks the question, why is the house dark tonight? The right wise question to ask is, where is that like? And likewise, as Christians in a marketplace, in order to be impactful, to leave a legacy behind, take it seriously by the grace of God in a very deliberate, wise manner, practice this principle of sort and light. It can be very, very effective. You only need a little sort to preserve a big piece of meat. The darker the night, the brighter is the light. Even though it may just the light of a matchstick, it can lit up the whole room. I want to share with you what I do. Uh, I ask people as a lawyer, what, 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 what do you do now? Many lawyers say that we're in a business, we are doing lawyering business. Nothing wrong with that. I told them that I have a different uh, idea. I have a different perspective of my business. I'm not in the business of law. 
I say I'm a business three things. I'm in the business of justice. My calling as a lawyer in the business of justice. Secondly, my calling as a lawyer in the business of peacemaking in a marketplace where there's strife, there's contention, there's enmity. My calling is to be a peacemaker in the marketplace. And my third calling as a lawyer is to be in a corporate world to make sure there's proper corporate governance. I'll share with you a little justice. Because we believe in justice, uh, God is a God of justice. Yes, we all know evangelicals, God is a God of justification. But the flip side of that same coin, God is also the, uh, the God of justice now. God is jealous of justice. And if a lawyer is not convinced of his calling to be in the business of justice, I am not sure who else will be called to do this part of ministry in the marketplace, especially for Christian lawyers. And because from day one, it's part and parcel of the ethos and the ethics of our firm. We set aside, we tied our professional time, talents, money, resources to do kingdom work in the marketplace. And we have a full-time person that we funded out of my own pocket, someone, I'm nurturing her to do all this pro bono work for quite a number of years already in order to be an instrument of justice in the marketplace. And over the years, we have fought some, uh, by the way, we sued the government of Malaysia also lost count, to be honest. I think about 30 times. At the moment, there are still three or four cases outstanding. We are not anti-government or pro-government. We are pro-justice. During Barisan's time, we have sued the government. During Pakatan's time, we have sued the government. Now, under the existing uh, Perikatan government, we are still outstanding cases against them. We do quite a fair bit for uh, statelessness people. Navin's case, Navin, uh, father local Indian, mother Filipina, born out of wedlock. Uh, unfortunately, my mother disappeared, went back to Philippines. Navin went to school up to 12 years old and then uh, uh, went to secondary school. They look at his IC and record. They say that he is stateless. You cannot go to school. And his world fall apart. When a person is stateless, is a personal non grata in the country. You can open an account. Nobody want to employ you. You can't go to hospital for registration. You're not entitled to so, so, so many other things. And this was a poor family. Somebody recommended to us. We took the case, fought all the way. A high court, we won the government, uh, the Home Ministry appeal to the Court of Appeal. We went up to all the way to the Court of Appeal. And then to prove that uh, so long as uh, one of the uh, parents is a Malaysian, you're entitled to citizenship. Irrespective that you're born out of wedlock, irrespective that the one of the parents is a non-citizen. Because they are not married, uh, the issue is uh, how do you know Navin belongs to this Malaysian Indian man? And we took a, a what you call a, a DNA test. And first time in, in, in legal history in this country, DNA, DNA test is allowed and we established that. And, she, uh, and uh, Navin finally got her citizenship. And we told Navin that you are the recipient of this goodness and kindness from God. One day when you grow up, do likewise, pay it forward to those you come across who I need. We also done for Raymond Coe's case, Amri Chapmat, for the Suhakam inquiry. 
And now we are suing the government of the day. Uh, Raymond Coe's case at the uh, Sohakam level, we are part of the legal team, now going to court. My dear friend, part of the earlier legal team, Dr. Jared Gomez, is suing the government on behalf of uh, Susanna and Amri Chipmark. We adopted that family. We filed a suit against the government of Malaysia. First time in the history of the government of Malaysia, we sue the government of Malaysia, the prime minister, the prime minister, the home minister, the uh, former IGP, the current IGP, the uh, head of special branch, and another 15 senior police officer in PDR, PDRM. Virtually, we have made enemies out of some of the most powerful people in this country. For the sake of justice, we want to hold the powers that be accountable. Winning, fine. Losing, also fine. Winning is secondary. But justice needs to be done. We need to hold all people accountable, name them, and shame them. Amri's case is very, really pitiful. Amri has been accused to be a Shiite. At the moment, if I accuse as a Shiite, the Muslim community, the whole community don't dare to come near you. And we read of that. My firm sent my legal assistant and two others went all the way to release, introduced ourselves, adopted their family to be their legal counsel for free, pro bono, to make sure that justice is done for their family. Amri's wife, when we met her in Burleigh, tears in her eyes. They said, why are you doing this to me? My own people all have deserted me. You are all strangers to me. Only Christians do that kind of thing. There are many other cases. Over the years as a lawyer, most of the satisfying cases that I handle, not the multi-billion dollar uh, adult, uh, cases that I handle, but little, little things like that, whereby we invested in people's life, set the seeds for a future legacy. And I'm sure the Lord will be pleased when disciples of Jesus Christ obedient to our calling in that marketplace. We are also involved in the, uh, the, uh, the Allah cases. The latest one is the uh, Jura Island case. We won at the high court. Our lead counsel is our dear brother Lim Heng Singh, excellent counsel. In fact, his submission, I told someone that we are compiled a submission, publishing in the book, let the archive, archive it for the Church of Malaysia for future generations to keep. These are legacy making. The government has appealed to the Court of Appeal. We will take them on. It's expected to go all the way to the federal court. We are also currently outstanding, not only like, uh, not only uh, a Jura Island's case, not only Amri's case, also Linus' case. Linus, we, we represented a multiracial, uh, 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 what do you call, multiracial residents uh, near to Linus, sue the government of the day, and also making legal history, first time in legal history, we sued the entire cabinet. That time was the uh, Pakatan government. From Dr. Mahathir downwards, all the 28 cabinet ministers were sued, including Linus. Again, we make enemies of some of the most powerful people in this country. 
whether we win, whether we lost in material, I always tell people, have you heard of the story of David and Goliath? And God in his goodness, as Dieter David, we have taken on the government and won quite a few significant battles. And one is the Orang Asli case that we won in Termolo some years ago. I have no time to share with you that during Park last time, we sued them all the way to the court of appeal. So, set a legacy in a marketplace. Our lives transformed by the goodness and the mercy of God, not for nothing. God has a purpose and a calling for us. And especially those who are in a marketplace, God already carved out a little niche of the mission field for us. That one day when we are no more around, this legacy may continue by the culture that we practice and the values that we practice, we pass on to the next generation. And then lastly, as I say, if you put God first by loving people, by taking care of the planet, be law abiding and be a faithful sort and light in the kingdom of God for the sake of the kingdom, for justice, for, for, uh, for peacemaking. I also involved in a lot of peacemaking. I'm a qualified uh, certified mediator over the years. I'm also a counselor in the church as an elder. I didn't know that God uh, with all these skills, skill set and experience and my corporate background and accounting background all come into the play. I do a lot of mediation and peacemaking for corporate disputes, shareholders disputes, especially family disputes now. Uh, it's all by the word of mouth. Uh, virtually all cases come to me, I help to settle them. Not too long ago, in the midst of a trial, they sat for a trial for four days after first day, somebody recommended the sister uh, and the brother and the brother-in-law came and see me. It's a family dispute with another brother and sister-in-law. They have been fighting for about uh, four years and spent legal fees about almost uh, 400,000 ringgit. And then somebody say that, why not you come and see Kenny Ng? He can help you to mediate. They came and see me. So the next morning, a bit pricey, I went to court. I spoke to uh, uh, my side of the lawyer. He reluctantly, he has a lawyer, he has two senior counsel, three or four lawyers his side. The other side have even a bigger team of lawyers, senior lawyers, because at stake is many, many millions. So in my seniority, I politely requested, they give me a little face, they say, all right, we have tried mediation for many years, they can't settle, no harm, last minute you try, we will stand down the case until noon time, lunch time. So after that, when the case was called, I stood up, thankfully the judge was uh, Dr. K.K. Wong, a fellow Christian, and uh, I've appeared before him, settling cases like that. I told him like that, like that. He says, very good. Uh, Dato Kenny have appeared before me, helped to mediate many cases successfully. I'll stand down the case, your try. He says, uh, if you go ahead with the uh, court case, no matter what my decision, it won't be better than if you all can settle out of court. I'll stand down the case, you try to mediate, if by lunchtime you can't, you let me know, settle and uh, mediate until you settle. We tried, by lunchtime we couldn't. And after lunch, there was that glimmer of hope at 3 p.m. There was some concession made. And I seized hold of that. Finally, by four o'clock, we have a settlement in principle. Uh, we told the judge, the judge said, very good, don't go home do the settlement, draft it now. 
And uh, he said, if necessary, into the night, I'll be around until you're settled. Then I give the court order based on this uh, settlement. And we drafted that settlement there and then, finished at 9 p.m. that night with the help of the judge, Dato K.K. Wong. And he gave a consent judgment based on that settlement. And in that case, in one go, I settled for them seven other disputes connected to that case in their family. And when the case was adjourned, my client, that lady, came to me, hold me so tight, tears in her eyes. That though this case, I've been crying every morning when I wake up thinking of this case, fighting my brothers for all these years. And the brother and the brother-in-law came also embraced me. That was one of my most satisfying moment as a lawyer in my career. And next week, they throw a big lunch for me to celebrate. And I did the settlement for them, whatever, who takes what, everything else. Uh, disperse their, their assets, comes into many millions. And for the mediation, everything, I charged them 25,000 ringgit. They were so pleasantly surprised. For their litigation, by then, they already spent 400,000. And when the case did not go, go ahead, subsequently, I heard from my client, their lawyer sent another fees for 200,000. So have our calling be very clear. Are we in the business for the sake of business making money? Or are we in a business of justice and peacemaking? And also, I also convinced that about my calling is in the corporate world. In that on that basis, in my professional capacity, I'm independent director for five public listed company. I, I, I look at myself as a role to make sure that the owners of all these businesses keep to the straight and narrow way, comply with whatever statutory rules, requirements, and laws to make sure that the minority shareholders, the pub, investing public's uh, rights and interests are taken care of. And I also sit in five different uh, audit committee, chairman of two, Previously, I also sit as in the audit committee for Ta, uh, uh, Ta College uh, Education Foundation and various other foundation, charity foundation, to make sure people keep to the straight and narrow and comply with the law. And once we are faithful in putting God first by loving people, by taking care of the planet we operate in, God in his goodness and mercy will bless us with profit. This is not my problem. This is God's problem. We take care of what we are called to be obedient. And this is the reward. And at the end of the day, when we are profit, three questions you got to ask yourself. One, do I pay my tax honorably? Two, do I give my tithes in a clear conscience? Three, after that, what do I do with my surplus profit? Yes, there's a place for investment to make sure our family has taken care of. There's a place for investment to make sure, you know, our material things are taken care of, children's education, no problem with that. But I'd like to share with you, once you make profit, set aside a portion over and above your tithe to invest in the kingdom of God by leaving a legacy as well. I support multiracial, one Indian, one Malay, one Orang Asti child. I adopt them for many years down. It's only 700 ringgit a month. That's 700 ringgit. 
my 700 ringgit can't change the world. My 700 ringgit a month to an orang asli child is going to change his world. Likewise for that Malay child, for the Indian girl. And I believe when they grew up with that legacy they've inherited, they'll pay it forward as well. I do pro bono work. I nurture a girl, Christian girl, Larissa, young Christian lawyer. She have the conviction on to do product pro bono work, fight for justice. I adopted her, park her in my firm. Personally, from my uh, salary, I set aside to guarantee her 6,005 a year as a minimum income. And she'll take care full time. All this pro bono work and all this community work I do for the kingdom of God as advices uh, to, to uh, uh, Dato Chua Jui Ming's uh, FRM to, to many other things, she will help me. And my law firm provide the infrastructure, the clerical support and everything else for her. I'm so proud of her. She's in the forefront of those cases that I mentioned earlier on, even though she's such a young lawyer. I remember the Suhakam inquiry. She alone single-handedly put Tan Sri Kali, the former IGP, on the witness stand to grill and uh, to grill him left, right, and center. And I believe the little six thousand five a month that I invested. I'm quite convinced 20 years down the road, Larissa will be a very prominent human rights lawyer in this country. This is investment in the kingdom of God, setting a legacy. I finish with a story. Time is running. There's a boss, construction site. One day he went to the construction site, met with three of his workers, all squatting there, doing their work. The boss asked the worker A, what are you doing in your job? The worker A, without enthusiasm, without looking up, he said, boss, I'm laying a brick. The boss asked second worker, worker B, what are you doing? The second worker with more pride Look up to the boss, I'm building a wall. And the boss asked the worker C, what are you doing? Worker C jumped up enthusiastically, faced the boss. He said, boss, boss, I'm building a huge cathedral for the glory of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, is our calling just a bricklayer or a war builder? Or are we building a grand cathedral for the glory of God? Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Dado Kenny, for that heart warming and direct and frank sharing regarding how to build a legacy. Uh, we are so touched by the story and the, what you have done. And really, it's an inspiration to many. And uh, there are some questions now being posted. And uh, we will post the question to you, Dato. And then we pray that you will be able to assist these people who are asking this question. The first question. First question is, Mr. Kenny, what do you do to employ who steals company's money sheet? If they don't have good intention to repay back the money stolen, that is run away. Sorry, say again. What, what do you what do you do to employee who steals money oh. sheet? If they don't have good intention to repay back the money stolen, that is run away. Yeah. 
this this is a very pertinent question and it is not uncommon uh, occurrence in companies now we have even clients coming to see us you know uh, this honest uh, employee what you do uh, even though I'm a lawyer, I'm in the business of justice, but justice must always balance up and the other principle of mercy. Justice, mercy is always way on that scale. Mm. And of course, a wrong is done. You can lodge a police report and then a, a criminal case, the police can take action. They may or may not take action. It's also a civil case, you can sue him or that amount. But usually these are very drastic, drastic measure. If it goes ahead, more often than not, you're going to ruin that employee. So uh, there may be an alternative. Usually alternative is by persuasion, calling that person to come uh, with a threat of a police report and a threat of suing and force them to come to the table and negotiate some kind of settlement to do a settlement, uh, do a, a settlement agreement. Uh, usually, that's what I do. Mm. And then, uh, if I'm the employer, uh, I will speak my mind, discipline him, everything else, and make sure he learn his lesson. I don't think I want to ruin his future. No. Mm -hmm. And especially employee, uh, they have, have uh, dependent families, and especially if they are young, and especially the act was impulsive, you know, rather than contrast or habitual. Then mm -hmm. you tend to say that there needs more mercy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at the uh, case by case basis. No. But more importantly, make sure you have a good system in mm -hmm. the first place, you know risk management, internal control, and make sure you invest the values of open, openness, transparency, accountability, and make sure that trust is prevalent in that system. Ooh. When you have a transparency, accountability, a boss is open, boss is trusting I, uh, both ways, these sort of things less likely to happen. Okay, thank you. I also sit in a, a risk management committee in some PLC. And it's, it's a common, uh, not an uncommon occurrence. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. The next question, what's the best way to leave a will and how often should we review and update it? Mm. Everybody needs a will. Uh, will, as I say, can be tangible assets. Uh, whatever that we have, assets. And not only that, we can also leave behind a will, written in that will as uh, when, 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 when clients come and see me uh, as a lawyer to do their will, I also advise them, you know, not only these things that you leave behind, you want to leave behind certain life lessons or mm. values, you know, or certain things that are good for your future dependents, you know. Mm so they can put in the will as well. And in fact, on that, I also advise many family to draft family charters, mm. the values for the family, family charter. And then those family that do big business, I also do a family constitution for them. Family charter is legally uh, non-binding, but a uh, family constitution, I make it legally binding. Mm. So this can be a life, part and parcel. Mm. And then will, uh, will is, is, uh, a will is just very much like a photograph. You take that photo at a point in time. But knowing life, knowing people, life and people, things are not static, it's fluid. So it can change. So when there are major changes or some changes, you've got to periodically review your will. Sometimes what we have in a will, uh, you sell some of it in that pool, and you accumulate new assets, this may not be captured. And then the beneficiaries you put in that will, somehow uh, uh, someone you think is in need, but over a period of time, your daughter is in need, but thank God you marry a rich husband, you think that the need is lesser, you make adjustment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So it is a life document 
periodic review when there are change in circumstances, both in your assets and both in the circumstances of your beneficiaries. I advise that kind of thing quite a lot. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Now, uh, to all of you, if you still have any question, uh, please pose them in the chat in the chat uh, section and we'll bring it up to Dato. The next question. How to apply the principles you shared for semi-retired or more for retired person? Yeah. In the kingdom of God, there's no retirement. Our old tires run ball, we retire and get a new set of tires. <laughs> <laughs> that the new set of tire we refire when we are <laughs> when we when we lose some steam, you know. Yeah. So so uh, in the kingdom of God, in that sense, uh, God has always a purpose for us to do. Now you adjust according to your own circumstances. Fiction. Mm. I'm in this world not for nothing. Now God has mm. created me. God has saved me. God has sustained me. For some little purpose, at least, you know, find that little purpose, whether I'm a politician, whether I'm a, a homemaker, whether I'm a king, or whether I'm just a, a doorkeeper. No difference, whether I'm retired or not retired. And the same principles you can apply. Setting a good legacy, leaving behind good values, show those values, mm. nurture, invest in people with a hope that what we invest goodness in due course of time in the goodness of god's time mm. there will be a bountiful harvest of goodness amen, amen. Right? Mm. for the three children i supported for navin for many other people in future i'm no more around there'll be somebody the next generation harvest those uh, 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 harvest those uh, uh, bountiful fruits of goodness which will bear in due course of time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Thank you. There's another question. Dato, there are still children born out of wedlock with the father, a Malaysian facing citizenship issue. Mm. How do I resolve this with JPN? Yeah, call me. Call me. Write down my number 019 222 16. One one. I repeat, zero one nine two 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 one six one one. We have a special unit handling cases like that. Mm. You're talking about the future of a child, mm. yeah. and I've got a soft spot for children. I I come from a big family, poor poor family. Mm. Uh, that's why one of the important ministry I choose is children. I also sit as a trustee in uh, Dignity for Children and also Spices, a center for children with special needs. Mm. I was uh, the original founder of that uh, NGO. Uh, okay. Call me, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. What about the setting up of a family trust? Ah, uh, yes. Important. In fact, uh, last week I, I advised one very rich tycoon in the country on this family trust. There will be a follow up meeting this Wednesday again. Yeah, it is a highly uh, a complex matter. It's important trust to protect against your creditors to make sure that, uh, as I say, that uh, uh, the assets in future goes to the right person mm. and so that there won't be a dispute and misunderstanding when you're no more around. Again, if you call me, this is highly technical subject matter as well. Okay, okay that's good. Next. The next, what criteria to adhere in selecting executors or executrices for our will? Mm. Two very important things. Uh, somebody who is reasonably uh, educated, you know, at least know how to read and write, understand certain basic things. And then uh, secondly, somebody who is sensible and wise, and uh, most importantly, a person of integrity. They may not be uh, 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 they may not be sound on the technical things, but if they are wise and men of integrity, they refer to the accountant, refer to lawyers like me, everything will hold their hands accordingly. Okay. It can be family members, relatives, 
or outsiders or a combination of people. And usually as trustees and executives, don't just have one person, at mm. least have two, three, or if necessary, four, so that there is better accountability. All right. Mm. All right, thank you. Um, there's no more question posted. Um, and anyone who would like to ask Dato any question now before I pass this time back to our chairman? Yeah, Brother Nick, can you uh, unmute. unmute yourself and you can post the, ask this question directly? Please unmute yourself. I, oh, okay. Thank you very much for your very inspirational talk. And especially, you know, you've given us so many personal examples from yourself and uh, from your law firm, uh, how you fought against people who are who do not have any defense for themselves, uh, especially on the subject on money, uh, which do not does not belong to us, but we are only stewards mm. of God's money. Now I I've heard that uh, there are two. Two people, I think, who probably initiated these pledge funds, uh, Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett. They pledge, I think, probably over ninety percent of of their wealth to some charitable organizations. And following that, I think many many of of billionaires offered such pledge. I wonder whether, it, and I think, what if said so far to uh, in this in this presentation i think is very inspirational and i believe that you know some of us may be both moved to want to also help others because uh, of what you have said now i just wonder if in malaysia there are any such movements or any people who will take the cue from Buffett and uh, Bill Gates in terms of asking billionaires or people who are rich uh, to set aside most of the money or significant amount of the money to charitable organizations? Uh, yeah, the questions to me, huh? Yes. Uh, 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 yes. Yes. There are, there are various foundations, and in fact, I'm advisor to some, helping them to incorporate. Uh, I'm, I, I'm reasonably active in the Chinese community as well. We got to understand part and parcel of the Chinese culture is this: now. when, when, especially they are nobody, they are small, and over a period of years, they have built up a business empire. It is expected of them as a cultural attribute that they give back to society. Mm. And in that sense, they set up foundation to make sure that uh, 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 they have taken for that society, they give back. And there's always a Chinese saying that uh, when the little river flows through the sea, the little river must always remember, be grateful to that source. Mm. So they do it quite a fair bit. And the two things that they, they like to do is this now. Usually it's on education. And this is also very much a Chinese cultural trait. Education. Education. And the other thing that they like to do is for orphanages. Uh, and then uh, sometimes this foundation, they apply for tax exemption, there's added incentive for them to give. Mm. Uh, likewise, Christians we gave, our gift is basically left hand giving, right hand not knowing, mm? or we ought to do that. Many Chinese people do that as well, but on the other hand, there are some who set up foundation as a platform for their AMP, advertising and publicity and PR. To me, there's no issue. Whatever your motive may be, certain good charitable act is done for the community anyway. Uh, there are various uh, uh, foundations. In fact, yesterday we have our first anniversary of our foundation. 
there was a foundation called uh, Tungku Abraman uh, uh, College Alumni Association. We set up a foundation, uh, TAA is Tungku, Abra Tungku Abdul Rahman College Alumni Foundation which, uh, uh, Association. We set up a foundation called TAA Education Trust Fund. Uh, that was set up in 2019. I helped to set it up. We got tax exemption. The whole idea is to make use of this foundation to mobilize the Chinese community's donation and the foundation that this money collected will be used to help lecturers and students of Ta College. Ta College, of course, they have a foundation called Ta College Education Foundation. Rightly or wrongly, their education is perceived by the Chinese community as controlled by certain political party. So sometimes they want to donate, but they, are, uh, they don't like the political party. They don't want to donate. So we say, it's okay, we form a neutral one. Neutral mm -hmm. one called TAA Education Trust Fund. And, uh, uh, and then uh, there's representative from the various Chinese community. Yesterday, we had our first AGM uh, hosted by Tan Sui Lim Wei Chai in, in his office. He's a very generous man. Tan Sri, uh, uh, they are all, all, all the who's who in the Chinese community were there for the lunch. Eh? Basically, representative of the guilds association, various Chinese associations, they were all there. I'm there in my capacity as an uh, independent professional, as a lawyer, for the whole thing as an asset trustee. So this is one one foundation. Similarly, uh, dignity for children is also a foundation. You contribute to that tax free for uh, especially refugee children and poor children who don't have a chance for education. If you attend one of those uh, the, uh, graduation, uh, graduation ceremony, you hear the testimony of these students, you can't hold back in tears. We have heard of lady coming from war-torn Islamic country, no education, come from negative background, no education, a lot of hatred, a lot of strife, came in and then finished from, from five, got a scholarship, want to do some professional course, and then he says that once I do that, I'm go back to my country, uh, to be a blessing to my country because dignity for children have done this to me. So okay. this is a worthy foundation to put in your money and many others as well, I can continue. All right. right. Thank you. Uh, due to time constraint and the time is up, uh, I know Brother Ellen, you have lifted up your hand for our for, uh, ask a question, but uh, we'll hold your question for the time being. And I'll pass this time back to Dr. Tan, our chairman, and maybe at the fellowship time, you may even, you can bring up the message again uh, with our speaker. Uh, Brother Tan Tik Singh, you pass back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard, for moderating <clears throat> the session very well. And also want to thank Dato Kenny for availing himself and also taking time to come and share with us. Indeed, that we can see uh, here today that he's truly a role model who inspires us, you know, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And it is indeed that also the testimony and the sharing that he has shared with us really inspire all of us today. And believe that many of us are also inspired by his talk, right? <clears throat> next week, uh, next two weeks from now, we have uh, another a wonderful speaker, uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Yo Pei Li, who will be coming on to speak to us because in this, during this pandemic, we realized that many teenagers are actually having these suicidal thoughts. And because of even family uh, issues and also the you know, dysfunctional of the families. So Dr. Yo Pei Li, he's a trained and also a qualified counselor who lectures counseling in the University of Monash University. And uh, she is going to come and share 
with us on recognizing the signs. Because <clears throat> once you can recognize the sign of this suicidal sign, you can actually prevent it, all right, an intervention, you know, by proper counseling. So <clears throat> do tune in so that you can come and also uh, we will post uh, for you to actually register to come and join this webinar. And uh, I just want to thank you before we close. Let us close with a word of prayer. Yes. <clears throat> I get my, uh, this, uh, my wife, Sister Pinky, just to close with a word of prayer. Yes, Father, we thank you for amazing impartation by your beloved son and servant, uh, Kenny. We thank you for his life, sacrificially, Lord. Father, do all this for your glory. Thank you for his labor of love. And Lord, we ask for your protection over him and his whole entire family and over the work that, Father, you have established for your glory. So, Father, we thank you for everyone that is here in this uh, webinar talk and uh, many others that will hear our recording in our uh, Family First uh, Malaysia website. We just pray that you will also stir in our hearts to leave a good legacy, Lord, to be able to be a blessing to many out there that needs the touch and the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.